Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, session with the title of Introduction to Intelligent Systems. Uh, my name is uh, Mohammed Wahbi. Uh, I'm an assistant uh, professor in the field of uh, computer engineering and artificial intelligence. I would like uh, to welcome uh, my colleague, uh, Professor uh, Emmanuel. Um, he is an associate uh, professor in the field of, and actually he is the chair of automation and uh, robotics uh, and the Department of Computer Engineering and Automation uh, Faculty of Electrical Engineering, Co Computer Science and Information Technology, uh, University of uh, OSIEC. Uh, this session uh, is uh, introduced to you uh, under the project of uh, eprof Eng, that is an Erasmus Plus project, uh, which is being uh, conducted by uh, uh, four uh, universities at Egypt, uh, Arab Academy, uh, Ain Shams, Aswan, and Nile as well. Uh, in cooperation with our uh, partners at Euro, uh, and one of this uh, uh, of these uh, partners, University of uh, Osiak. Uh, so I will uh, now uh, give the screen uh, to my colleague uh, to give uh, to us uh, this very interesting session. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh... Thank you, um, Dr. Mohamed Wabi, for the introduction. Um, this uh, presentation is, uh, as uh, Dr. Mohamed Wabi said, uh, is uh, part of the innovative life uh, long e learning for professional engineers. And practically, it is an introductory uh, lecture that I have on the topic of intelligent systems. And within the next 30 to 40 minutes, uh, I plan to introduce uh, terms such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, soft computing, where we shall explain the terms uh, as well as the differences and similarities between the terms. Um, before I start, good afternoon to everyone. Once again, and as I said, uh, I'm Carlo Niarco uh, at the Faculty of Electrical Engineering, Computer Science and Information Technology in OSIEC. And uh, my research interests include uh, robot vision, uh, soft computing methods and machine learning. So probably most of the examples that I'll provide uh, during this short lecture will be from these fields. OK, so the first uh, thing we have to deal, deal with is uh, what are intelligent systems? Now, um, from the phrase, uh, there are a lot of uh, definitions that exist. However, uh, the, f the phrase itself implies that uh, we expect such a system to in some way uh, perceive the environment and interact and respond accordingly with the environment around it. Now, intelligent systems basically can be devices, machines or software. Uh, in the final slide, we shall come back to once again what are intelligent systems, but um, basically uh, intelligent systems have uh, some or a combination of uh, the following properties that is they can be embedded connected to the internet gather data analyze data communicate with other systems they have the capacity to learn from experience or even the ability to adapt to a given situation based on current data um, some few examples even though there are a lot out there of uh, intelligent systems uh, are, uh, for example, Roomba, the automated vacuum cleaner that uh, is uh, on the market. You have recommendation systems, you have chatbots, you have uh, Internet of Things, uh, Internet of Things devices such as smart meters, traffic lights. More complex uh, intelligence systems include autonomous vehicles or UAVs or unmanned aerial vehicles. 
Now, of course, with, expect, uh, with respect to these, uh, these more um, complex systems, there is still a lot of work to be done for us to achieve full auton autonomous uh, activities. Um, not only do we have technical complications, but we also have ethical issues uh, such as who is to blame if such a system makes a wrong decision and there's a damage to property or even worse, loss of life. So before uh, we can proceed, then we have to go back to the definition of what is intelligence. Um, the dictionary provides the definition as the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skills. Wikipedia gives a more longer definition we have capacity for logic, understanding, self-awareness, learning, emotional knowledge, reasoning, planning, creativity, and so on and so forth. And even by uh, looking at these definitions, we can see that our currently so-called intelligence systems that I mentioned previously, still have a long way to go before they become real intelligence systems, especially if we are going to take into consideration understanding or self-awareness or emotional knowledge. What is intelligence composed of? Well, basically we can divide them into like uh, five groups, consists of reasoning, where we can think of it as, uh, or consider it as the set of uh, processes that uh, enables us to sort of uh, provide basis for judgment or making decisions or predicting some events. Learning, that is the activity of uh, gaining knowledge or skill by practicing, studying, being taught or experiencing something. Problem solving, well, this is a bit more uh, I'm not trying to say that the others are less complex, but one of the things with uh, pro problem solving is where we perceive some current situation and uh, try to arrive at a desired solution by taking a path, but then we do not know beforehand whether, we are, whether the path is going to be blocked by some other impediments or problems. So it's a process of selecting the best suitable uh, alternative out of a set of possible alternatives in order to uh, reach a desired goal without any knowledge what is going to happen in the future, just taking into consideration what we know now. Perception, that is where uh, most of the research in <clears throat> artificial intelligence is currently being performed because this is where most of the intelligence systems are um, sort of, uh, I wouldn't say lacking, but uh, we are trying to achieve the same sort of perception as we humans have, that is using visual perception. And uh, a lot of research is being uh, performed here. So here we have um, with the use of uh, radar, uh, RGB cameras, depth cameras, and so on and so forth. And uh, we also have, that is uh, linguistic intelligence where it's the ability to use, to understand, to speak, write, some verbal or written language. Now, these are the basic um, fields of intelligence as uh, we humans know. And so anything that comes out of this field that can be implemented into a system, we shall consider it to be an intelligent system. Now, <clears throat> Looking at uh, what I've already explained so far, we, come, uh, we can uh, conclude that there is a difference between human and machine or artificial intelligence. Basically, we humans, um, we perceive by patterns and um, we recognize uh, events or locations or um, uh, things that happen by pattern recognition where we sort of match information that uh, we are receiving with information that are stored as patterns in our brain. With uh, machine intelligence currently, it's uh, that is the per uh, perceived by a set of rules and using data. 
and they store and recall information using such algorithms. Now, um, one example where we can see uh, the difference between human intelligence and specifically with respect to how we, we, we conclude using patterns and um, uh, uh, knowledge about the environment is, for example, where we are able to identify objects even if some parts are occluded or missing. Now, here we have an example <coughs> of um, a scene. This is one of our research uh, uh, problems where currently you have uh, neural networks which can define and classify a lot of objects. So a neural network which has been trained to uh, identify chairs has uh, been trained with over a thousand or more pictures of chairs and it can conclude based on their relative positions that for example if you have like four legs and a horizontal surface and a vertical surface inclined at an angle that it would be a chair or maybe it can have three legs or two legs. Now if uh, such a system is provided with this scene that we have in front of us it would classify this as a chair it would most probably also classify this as a chair with a given probability, not 100%. It would also, that is, it might classify this as a vase since it has in enough information that there you have flowers over here. But then to classify what is behind over here as a chair will be almost but impossible unless it takes into consideration the current screen. However, this seems quite simple for us as humans. Immediately we see the screen, we, we are aware that we have four chairs on the screen, which is not all that simple for uh, an, an intelligent system. So um, based on this, we now have to uh, define. So we have really, we realized that we have what is human intelligence, that is what we have, and we have artificial intelligence. Um, machine or human intelligence of course is currently inferior to human intelligence and uh, the definition of artificial intelligence has even changed uh, over time the first time the term artificial intelligence appeared was uh, at a workshop in uh, 1956 at uh, Dartmouth College where McCarthy um, coined the term Later on, already in 1990, due to the definition that uh, it is the science and engineering of making intelligent machines, we realize it's a bit too, there's not enough of description of what is an intelligent machine. Then we have uh, additional definition, which is provided in the book by Dan Partisan in 1990 as a branch of computer science, which is concerned with the study and creation of computer systems that exhibit some form of intelligence. So already over here, we realize that we have to um, sort of um, downplay the, the intelligence of uh, machines. That is, they exhibit some form of intelligence. Um, we shall go through timeline of artificial intelligence uh, through some basic examples. So 1950, Alan Turing uh, came out with the Turing test, which defined a standard for a machine to be called intelligence. In 56, artificial intelligence, the term was defined. Uh, with respect to the field of automotion, which is currently, of course, uh, now Popular not to mention, okay, over here we have example Google, we have Tesla, we have other companies who are already in the field. But uh, through automotion, for example, as far back as 1977, uh, the Stanford car cart was um, introduced and basically it was a small cart which uh, uh, was designed to uh, operate indoors uh, in a room with simple objects which were painted in contrast in black and white colors and they were uniformly lit because there was a lot of problem at that time with respect to uh, vision and uh, images that were being processed. In the 89, uh, the next uh, Alvin, that was uh, one of, how should I say, maybe completely, completely. I wouldn't go to, uh, that far to say completely, but uh, 
autonomous vehicle that was designed and based on neural networks and uh, it used images from a camera uh, and a, a laser range finder to determine uh, the output as to in which direction, that is how to turn the, 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 uh, the steering wheel of the car in which direction to, to, to the car should go. Um, 1994, um, there was also the NavLab uh, 5 uh, had uh, took a trip from Pittsburgh to San Diego and uh, navigated over 2,850 miles, but uh, they had uh, maybe about uh, 50 miles of uh, this uh, session where it, a human had to uh, step in and control the vehicle. Of course, in all these situations, always uh, there was a human being who was controlling uh, uh, what was happening. Uh, uh, in 1994, for example, the VMP driverless car was maybe one of the first truly autonomous cars. Uh, and just a fun fact, it was a product of a project which at that time uh, was financed to the tune of about 800 million euros. So just to um, get a perspective as to how much was put into that time to achieve some sort of autonomous vehicle. Um, with respect to analysis and communication in uh, natural uh, language, uh, as far back as uh, the 1960s, we had an inter interactive computer that carried out uh, dialogue in English language. Currently, we have Siri from Apple, Google Assistant, Cortana, Alexis from Amazon, and um, one of uh, the branches from this field of natural language is uh, the natural, natural language generation. That is a software that can sort of process and uh, transform structured data into natural language. So for example, uh, you extract the data from spreadsheets or videos or some other sources and create some sort of report so that humans can easily read from the report instead of trying to analyze all this uh, structured data. In consumer technology, well, currently we already have smartwatches, uh, mobile phones, and so on. Uh, in financial services, uh, with respect to artificial intelligence, the main uh, implementation is in fraud detection. And of course, once again, uh, natural language generation to generate reports from all the data that uh, they have available. Robotics going far back as 1960s until now, even though uh, there are a lot of um, breakthroughs in robotics, robots are still mainly used. 90 and more percent, 95 percent of robots are mainly used in, in the industry, for example, in car manufacturing industry, where uh, there is a need to perform precise or very repetitive tasks. <clears throat> now, uh, based on all this, uh, artificial intelligence uh, is divided into various branches and below that is over here, I provide the, the branches according to the association of computing uh, machinery, where artificial intelligence is defined uh, can be uh, divided into general AI, expert systems and applications, automated programming, machine learning, which is currently very, very popular, robotics, computer vision, distributed artificial intelligence. So here we see that artificial intelligence actually covers uh, a lot of fields, and there are a lot of research groups out there making progress in all these fields. And for us to truly come out with what we shall see, an intelligent system should uh, basically, be, basically be a combination of all these fields. But progress is made um, 
irrespective that is independently in all these fields. Of course, uh, experience from one field is transferred to the other. For example, machine learning in computer vision, computer vision in robotics and so on and so forth. OK, so now we've defined human intelligence, artificial intelligence, and now we go down to machine learning. <coughs> where this is one of the most uh, popular branches currently. And uh, based on the types of learning that we have uh, within machine learning, we can divide uh, this um, field of branch into three uh, sections. That is unsupervised learning, where um, we are des describing a class of problems that um, involves trying to uh, obtain a model that can describe or extract uh, relationships in data. Basically, it's the clustering problem. Methods which fall under this uh, section are k-means, Gaussian mixture, neural networks. I've intentionally um, noted neural networks here because later on I will just provide a brief overview to, of uh, neural networks. The next is uh, supervised learning, <clears throat> which uh, describes a class of problem that, uh, for example, uh, involves, uh, that is, we are trying to get a model that is learning the mapping between input uh, data, input examples or input measurements, and a target variable. An uh, output measurement. And we can divide uh, supervised learning into two groups, classification and regression, where classification is trying to predict a uh, class, the label, for example, based on some input parameters. Uh, it should, the system should say whether, for example, the picture being provided is a cat or a dog, that is dividing it to uh, class or maybe we have some other data, not only picture, maybe we have uh, data involving uh, height, uh, uh, weight, uh, color and so on and so forth. And then we are trying to uh, divide them into classes. Uh, the other group is uh, regression where we are trying to predict a numerical value. For example, one of the classical examples is trying to estimate the pri price of a house based on some parameters. For example, uh, the size of the house, that is the area or the number of rooms, bedrooms, the location of uh, the house, the year of construction, so on and so forth. And reinforcement learning, which is a type of dynamic programming that uh, trains um, algorithms using system of uh, reward and punishment. Uh, in reinforcement learning, that is uh, an agent learns by interacting with its environment. For example, we as humans learned how to walk as babies uh, using reinforcement learning. You try and stand up and then you realize if you don't put one leg forward, you will fall on your nose. And then you realize, OK, you have to immediately put the next leg forward and so on and so forth. So we get some feedback from the environment and that is the pain of falling on our nose and uh, we learn how to walk, for example. So <clears throat> we see that um, uh, based on all these definitions, um, AI is the broader term that we are trying to achieve to, uh, for it to be as close as possible to human intelligence. Machine learning is just one um, branch of field of AI and of late uh, deep learning is uh, basically the past 10 years is what is now uh, moving uh, machine learning and research in this field of AI forward and uh, it's uh, it's actually based on artificial uh, artificial neural networks that I mentioned earlier and uh, involves uh, neural networks with a lot of layers and a lot of parameters which need to be learned. Uh, there are a lot of different types of uh, neural networks such as recurrent neural networks, uh, convolutional neural networks and so on and so forth. And um, I think I have to mention that uh, I think and I think it's also the, the general feeling in the field that um, 
deep learning and reinforcement learning, especially and maybe even the combination of deep reinforcement learning is what is uh, going to be is where we're going to have the next breakthrough in this field. Even though we have had, in the, as I mentioned earlier, in the past 10 years, uh, a lot of breakthroughs, but in this particular section, I think here will uh, the most progress will be made in this uh, branch. Okay. So we have now defined these uh, terms, uh, sort of put them in relation with one another. But uh, at this point, I also want to um, introduce one new term or soft computing, which was first uh, used in a paper by Lofty Zadeh in 1981 to describe data that are partially probabilistic and partially possibilistic. Now, uh, soft computing has developed into a branch and is basically considered as a mix of three scientific uh, disciplines uh, involving fuzzy sets and systems, neural networks and evolutionary com uh, computation. So already we see that we also have now another field called soft computing, which has neural networks, which is related, uh, which is located in another field and all uh, with the aim of in this case with respect to soft computing it's um, we are trying to use um, uncertainty or imprecision to uh, create systems that are most uh, that are more ro robust because uh, generally real systems that we have in our world are not all that precise that is we have uh, some errors in measurements we have also some uncertainties as to for, for example particular location if you are talking about localization of a robot in, a, in in a given environment we always have to take into consideration that the, the exact position is not known unless we are using a gps system and other system to triangulate our uh, location but using uh, normal sensors such as vision or ultrasound or other similar sensors we always have uh, information that is, we do not have the com we do not have complete information, and soft computing tries to create models taking this into account. Um, so I'll go through briefly all these three sections: so neural networks, um, set of algorithms, uh, um, computing systems, which are inspired by the human brain that is how it all started of course we cannot create such a system but uh, they consist basically of large um, basic units which we refer to as neurons and uh, by connecting these neurons we get a system which is able to learn or infer from uh, past data now the basic unit of um, Neural, neural network is, as I mentioned, uh, a neuron, and it uh, consists actually of, um, you can uh, think of it as uh, a node which has several inputs, and each of these inputs are weighted, and uh, the, these weighted inputs are summed and compared uh, with uh, some sort of threshold and uh, the difference between this sum or how should i say the resultant sum of all these inputs serves as an input to an activation function which is basically a non-linear function which then generates a signal which is transmitted uh, forward now um, an example of such an activation function is, for example, the Tansig function, where depending on all this, that is when we sum these inputs, um, they are, that is the serve as the input to the function and the output of the function, for example, for this Tansig uh, provides a value between minus one and one. Now, a neural network can be considered to be, as is shown over here, uh, nodes, which have been arranged in layers and uh, normally have the input layer where we have the input data. Uh, if we have 
one or more hidden layers uh, with uh, deep neural networks we have five ten or even more hidden layers and uh, depending on the output that we are trying to model uh, the the neural network lens by adjusting the weights that i showed on the previous uh, screen by taking into consideration for, so for example if we assume we have some measurements um, input measurements and uh, output uh, corresponding output value when we provide the input measurements these measurements uh, pass through the neural network the model uh, calculates the 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 output value based on as showed that is the sum of the weights passing through each of those uh, functions generating outputs all these outputs are also weighted and then moved uh, transmitted to the next neuron and so on and so forth we generate the output um, value the output value is compared to the desired output value and an error based on the error that we have is the error is used to modify the weights that we have between these connections so as to get a model which uh, will provide an output as close as possible to the desired output um, they are used in classification examples for example uh, if you provide us an image as an input it should be able to if it's trained uh, well enough of course the currently trained neural networks out, out there which are able to differentiate between 100 classes and more over here we have just a simple um, display as to how it differentiates between whether it's a cat or a dog the next um, application is in regression where based on uh, the data we are trying to model a function that relates the input data with the output data in this simple example we are trying to model the day of the year with the temperature the outdoor temperature uh, where neural networks are implemented that is in pattern recognition speech recognition medical diagnostics and so on and so forth fuzzy logic <coughs> uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, actually it's uh, Lofty Zadeh who introduced uh, uh, fuzzy logic. Um, it allows us to make uh, decisions on inaccurate information. For example, I normally use this in my class uh, where when you are supposed to make a quick decision, is it uh, necessary that you provide all the details as to the danger that is currently um, eminent or you are supposed to immediately provide information as to uh, that the recipient is, should react immediately that is look out and move from the position where you are standing now uh, fuzzy logic is a generalization of classical boolean logic so for example, if we consider the set of, uh, that is, if we consider 20 degrees Celsius as the boundary between cold and hot, this implies that all temperatures below 20 degrees, irrespective of whether it's 0 or 19 degrees, is cold, and irrespective of whether it's 20.5 and 35 degrees is hot, we know that in the real world it's not like this but we actually have something which might be or looks depending of course where you are located in the world or how uh, we all because we all differently uh, react if i'm using this particular example with temperature we all differently have uh, react to whether something whether 15 degrees is cold or hot it's all subjective but just for this example we see that the range of whether something is hot or cold we can uh, define over a given interval so we can say that let's say around 18 degrees we can say it's um, 30 percent hot for example and of course this can uh, further be i wouldn't say complicated but we can further uh, define um, membership functions such as for example we say from zero to 
let's say 18 degrees that is this function this uh, describes how much we belong to the set of cold this yellow membership function defines how much we belong to the set of warm and this set defines how much we belong to the set of hot so if we take for example 15 degrees then we can say okay 15 degrees is 90 percent cold and let's say 10 percent warm why this sort of um, definition because uh, this sort of uh, transformation between a crisp set and a fuzzy set actually enables us to uh, uh, generate rules which are sort of if it is warm increase the temperature or decrease the temperature of the air conditioning system for example so we can use such uh, sentences which are similar to what we humans use to create a control system which for example should control the, the heating or cooling of, of uh, a room <coughs> so um, basically a fuzzy system involves fuzzy fire that is a set of those membership functions where all the crisp inputs are fuzzified that is they are translated into how much they belong to a particular set and then based on this we have a set of rules which are as i gave in that example uh, if then else rules if it's this then this else this using words such as if it's too hot if it's not that hot if it's too cold and so on and so forth and based on this when we uh, implement all these rules um, the rules are then aggregated and uh, we need of course to defuzzify what we have as a result to get uh, crisp output that is an exact value especially if it's a control system so that uh, the controller is able to to react accordingly uh, why do we use uh, fuzzy logic mathematical background is simple reasoning process is intuitive and easy to understand it's flexible tolerant of imprecise data and of course such a fuzzy system allows uh, us to model a continuous function of uh, given complexity but um, uh, even though uh, we say that uh, for example a fuzzy system can be constructed based on information provided by an expert this is also a drawback of fuzzy system because it requires an expert to provide the rules of the fuzzy system but we also have insight as to what is actually happening so if we see that something is not uh, happening the way that we want then we know that we have to modify add some rules or drop some rules so it's it's a two-edged sword uh, it can be combined with uh, uh, classic control systems and uh, for example fuzzy logic is used in air conditioners uh, washing machines vacuum cleaners uh, transmission systems automatic transmission systems in cars um, evolutionary uh, algorithms that we mentioned as a uh, field of uh, soft computing one of the most popular uh, one is uh, the genetic algorithm which is uh, a global optimization problem that is it's used in solving optimization problems where um, we can um, represent a solution as uh, one possible solution can be represented as uh, over here it's stamped a chromosome that is uh, where each chromosome consists of genes a gene is basically a parameter of the problem that we want to solve so if we have a set of parameters each parameter is represented by a gene set of parameters that is the set of parameters is a chromosome and a combination of possible values of this set of parameters is a chromosome and a set of chromosomes is a population so the system works by generating a set of possible solutions chromosomes we have <coughs> uh, 
uh, genetic operators involving recombination selection and mutation, which generate a new set of possible solutions. But one requirement for such for this uh, algorithm is that each solution um, that is it should be possible for you to, uh, for one to define uh, quality that is the quality of a given solution. Now this definition of the quality of a given solution is uh, the fitness function or the cost function that needs to be defined by the user of the algorithm. Now this fitness function depends only on the problem that we need to solve. And uh, we, for the, a given problem, you can use as many different fu fitness functions as you think is necessary. The only problem is that uh, the uh, number denoted by the fitness function uh, should give enough information as to differentiate uh, between the quality of each corresponding possible solution that we have in a given uh, population or set of um, solutions. And of course, uh, the general idea is, is as in evolution, better solutions have a greater probability. You will note I'm using the word probability that is it's not guaranteed, but they have a greater probability of um, creating new solutions for the next uh, population set. And uh, this movement between one population set and the other is actually a, an iteration of, of the algorithm. And with each generation, that is each iteration, uh, we get better individuals or solutions. Um, genetic algorithms, basically in this field of uh, optimization, there are a lot of other heuristic algorithms, of course, out there, but um, genetic algorithms can be used in, that is in situations where we can represent, as I said, all the independent parameters by genes, and this representation can either be binary, that is if it's such a problem, binary problem, or numeric, or text, uh, or other values, and if it's possible to evaluate such a solution. Those are the conditions before you can implement a genetic algorithm to solving an optimization problem. Uh, it can be implemented where, of course, classical methods cannot, are not applicable. For example, if the objective function of our optimization problem is not derivable or it's not continuous, um, can be used in, they, they are used, not, they, they are used in uh, various fields, finding the shortest path, product design, uh, for example, antenna design. Um, selecting the best combination of members from a set. And uh, finally, uh, we come to, uh, that is the conclusion where we see that uh, AI is, uh, can be considered to be the entire field of computing technology that exhibits anything remotely resembling human intelligence. Within AI, we have machine learning, in machine learning, we have deep learning, and we see we have soft computing in between uh, machine learning and soft and uh, AI. And uh, intelligent systems, we can uh, basically consider them to be, that is the emphasis with intelligent systems is actually on machines, which have some sort of AI capabilities implemented. So uh, this is basically the introduction that I normally have with uh, for the subject of uh, intelligent systems. And I thank you for listening and I'm open for questions. Thank you very much for your efforts and time. Uh, for the attendees, if you have any uh, question, you may send it via uh, question and answer uh, section. Uh, and we will give you a couple of minutes uh, to start uh, this discussion. Uh, meanwhile, I would like to ask uh, a question. <laughs> OK. OK, good. Uh, like on the beginning of your presentation, um, you have mentioned some different areas of AI, such as I of uh, Internet of Things uh, and other uh, fields. Uh, uh, 
uh, Internet of Things uh, examples of intelligent systems. OK, so you consider it as an intelligent system since well, they are employing intelligent techniques or since they are providing by nature intelligent solutions? Um, then considering them that is uh, intelligent systems, if they are able if to, to um, that is, we have some measurement from the environment and based on the measurement, some response. I mean, that is with Internet of Things, uh, actually depending on how low we want to go, it's uh, actually a matter of granul granularity. Um, at the lowest level, we might not consider it to be intelligent. At the next level, we might consider it to be intelligent. For example, um, you have a camera which is uh, located in front of a door and um, it takes a picture of you and you have system somewhere in the back which identifies you and opens the door or does not open the door, for example. OK, I see. OK, thank you. Uh, there is a question here. Um, he or she is asking, uh, which is your favorite development language or languages that you would prefer to use while developing and trying to solve AI problems? Um. OK, I'll put it this way. For quick and dirty proof of concept, Python. Uh, since I'm uh, involved with the robot vision, then when we see that it's working good enough, then we try and implement it in C or C++. That's that. OK, but <laughs> as you know, there are different uh, platforms like uh, C, C++, yes, of course. Um, that's uh, actually my favorite uh, language uh, too, by the way. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I mean, the question was w w what was my favorite, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I do not have a favorite. It's a matter of what I'm doing. I want to test proof of concept. I'll use Python because you have everything you can test. You immediately visualize and so on and so forth. When you go to C, C++, well, here you have to be careful what you're doing, what you're doing in memory. Are you sure everything is working because you've coded it well or not? <laughs> OK, I hope this answered the okay. question. Uh, another, uh, another one, uh, is a computational power of using a neural network is application, uh, I'm sorry, in applications considered a big challenge? I, I, I believe he is asking about the needed computational power of using neural network. Well, it. Um... It depends on the problem. Um, if for, uh, for the example that I mentioned with when you ask the uh, Internet of Things, if you have a camera uh, which uh, takes a picture, sends the picture to somewhere to the cloud where you have enough computational power to, to, to perform identification of a person, then OK, it's not that a problem. But if uh, you have, you want to create, you know, with a small embedded system, uh, you want to implement neural network on it. Uh, currently, all those neural networks which perform identification or classification, they are really networks with lots and lots of parameters to the orders of tens of thousands and so on. Implementing it on a small embedded system is is a problem with respect to computing power and respect to memory. So you have, of course, uh, uh, it's all, it, you know, it, it's a trade off. You will have to, uh, in order to download it to such a system, you'll have to simplify the network. The accuracy might not be as in the original neural network, but you have something that works. You know, it's it's all about the problem you need to solve and uh, the accuracy that is required, as well as the time needed to 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 process it. Or if it's uh, to open a door and the person stands in front of it, uh, in front of the door for about a second or two, it's okay. But if you require something that should uh, respond 
within 100 or 200 milliseconds, then you have it's a whole complete new ball game. I don't know. I hope I've answered the question. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, I I would like also to ask you another question. Like um, uh, nowadays, we can see AI is always uh, uh, actually uh, have been used widely uh, to solve many uh, problems in many different uh, research fields. Does this mean the traditional techniques are going to be uh, obsolete? Um, when you say traditional, what do you mean by traditional? <laughs> uh, let's say um, uh, crisp, not fuzzy. Uh, you know, uh, let's say it use um, hidden Markov model, not um, some AI techniques, uh -huh. uh, PCA, well, and etc. I, uh, you see. I think we we shouldn't um, throw out all the knowledge that we have because even in uh, in AI in machine learning, basically methods which already existed uh, before, only they have now been implemented in a uh, bit different way. So, for example, training of um, neural network back propagation algorithm. It's a gradient uh, method. Yeah minimization yeah. method, which has been taught in mathematics for, I don't know how long, iterative gradient. Uh, so uh, it's a combination of, you know, um, th that is why this field is so propulsive and uh, I, I am not one, I'm not inclined to um, exclude something because, for example, um, progress that has been made in one field or implementing a solution somewhere can definitely be used in completely different field. It's just that we have to uh, be able to identify and realize when such, a, how should I say, uh, transfer of knowledge is possible. OK, thank you very much. Um, OK, uh, I'm not receiving any more uh, questions. Okay. I hope uh, this session uh, was enjoyable for all of you. And uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Professor uh, Emmanuel for his uh, precious time and efforts he put in this uh, session. And I'm looking forward uh, to have him again uh, in another uh, session, uh, hopefully. To be very soon. <laughs> well, the, well, next time, then maybe I'll uh, provide some information about what we are doing over here. As I said, this was just real yeah. introduction. Yeah, basic introduction. Okay, thank you. It was thank also you. a pleasure. I hope uh, we have cleared some some of uh, the the differences between the buzzwords that exist out there, and hopefully make things easier for someone who is meeting this field for the first time. Okay, thank you very much. Jim, thank thank you. you. Guys. Bye. Goodbye.